cooking and preserving food to lighting city streets at night, energy powers our modern world, but many sources of energy pollute the lands and waterways around them. That's why we've invited three energy experts to demonstrate how the latest science and technology can provide reliable and renewable energy for everyone. They are Dr. Jara Hicks, a director with Community Power Agency, Dr. Sadaf Taimur, the director of sustainability and circularity at Goodwill Industries, Ontario Great Lakes, and Callum Harvey Scholes, the pilot deployment and research manager of Rewiring Australia. After their presentations, they kindly took questions from the audience. So before we start with the Q&A session, I'd like to thank our speakers for sharing their valuable knowledge and experience with us. And as I always say, with step-by-step -step and drop-by-drop, -drop, we will certainly make a big change for a travelable future. We'll move on to the first question, which is open to all, to all three speakers, and anyone can answer first. Today, we are discussing about the affordable clean energy and technology. In your view, why it has been difficult to adopt clean energy by nations? I come from a development studies background and a political economy background. So my answer to that is influenced um, in that way that we have established a global economic system, very established power dynamics within that. And, you know, in my country, in Australia, coal was the very first export of our country. And so our whole national economy has been very tied to coal-fired power generation and coal exports for a long time. And the there are a lot of political interests and corporate interests embedded in that way of doing things. And so um, I think it can take a lot of time to change uh, where there are those kinds of interests involved. But I think uh, we've got to the point now where... Um, the technology exists. It has been scalable. Um, and in Australia and in other parts of the world, small-scale actors, households and communities have been starting this transition already, proving that it's possible, bringing the costs down. And uh, it's just evident now that the, the cheapest form of, re of electricity going forward is, is renewable. Nobody can debate that anymore. So that's why I think the tides are turning. I'd agree with with Jara. I think that's um, yeah. I think power and, and influence have a lot to um, have, have a lot to do with it. Um, I think the economics as well have have been changing over time, and I think that's that's another part of the reason for the tipping point now. I think that we're we're moving towards uh, or we're ready over, and we need to you know really grab with both hands. Is that in most parts of the world it is now the cheapest source of energy renewables. Um, but I think we're then faced with the next problem, which is that the grid is not always ready for it. Um, and I think at every stage, there's kind of another, uh, there's someone else standing in the way with a new problem. And we need to be tackling these things you know, all at once. And that means testing. That means you know, governments getting out there and proving and helping industry and households and academics and the rest of it to, to demonstrate that this stuff does work because it looks like it should work. It just We just need to move a bit quicker and, and, and prove that. Um, but I think there's also there is a massive access issue um, globally. You know, I think there's this stuff has been test run and invested in first by wealthy countries who have the money, and that in some ways is is great because they've paid a far far more for this technology than than the rest of the world now needs to pay. But there needs to be a lot of work to invest, um, and we need to see that really at COP at the moment. You know, there's. Um, needs to be a lot more invested in making this accessible to, to communities around the world because it's it's also far more suitable to to remote communities to um to smaller communities where or, or communities that actually don't yet have a big electricity grid microgrids and solar and batteries are going to provide them with much cheaper much more ready and much more resilient access to power um and yeah it's really about getting it out there yeah i totally agree with uh jira and callum i think um it's a systems issue. It's definitely political and people who have money, um, they are the main players. But at the same time, on touching the technical side of things, I also believe that when it comes to starting something or piloting something, it is always expensive. So, for example, when Tesla started, it was pretty expensive. Uh, but then as it scaled and then techno people started becoming aware of technology and manufacturing starting started happening, the cost started to optimize, but then it was also then again a systems issue where regulations were affecting uh, the manufacturing as well. So um, that's what my point of view is. But 
I also agree with Callum that that uh, rural areas or communities which don't have access to these technologies, perhaps they can benefit a lot. And then they are best suited to for the rene- renewable energy because, so for example, agri- in the agriculture sector, people are testing how solar panel works in the agriculture, uh, agricultural settings or agricultural farms. And those those farms are not situated in urban settings they're usually situated in the rural settings so and those rural communities they don't have access to these kind of uh panels so uh, what can we do about it um perhaps subsidizing government subsidizing on one end but also communities seeing the benefit of installing solar panels and then how they can yield the benefits along with the uh, along with growing their crops they can also yield benefits related to energy tra- energy generation uh, so these are the kind of benefits they they need to know about uh, as well and then um this can help in um these kind of things can help in just transitions right thank you and i agree and uh to sum up this what i have understood the government will is uh, should be very strong to push this kind of an uh, initiative uh thank you for sharing your views now i'll ask specific questions to our speakers first question is for chara i was reading uh, uh, that australia needs to progress firmly on a policy policy dedicated to decentralized energy generation forgot to you what has been the roadblock for such kind of a development Australia has the the longest interconnected electricity grid in the world and it's highly complex the way that it operates and historically it has been very dominated by large scale generation in certain locations and so there is complexity in adjusting the both the, the technology of the poles and wires and the way that that system is managed to be a more distributed system that can accept two way flows of electricity so there's a technical element and then there's also the element around regulation and policy and the way that the energy market operates and then you get down to things like the rules around how a project connects into the grid and the process for for doing that so at every step of the way if you're a community energy project for example you and and there aren't it hasn't been done before it hasn't been done in that region before there's going to be uh new experiences and and new new challenges to overcome and i think we're only now beginning to understand how you know the all of those pieces need to fit together to be able to genuinely unlock some of the more decentralized options the the great thing is that our country is now focusing more on this and um i think there is more space recognized and more role recognized for household and and community scale and decentralized renewable energy um so that's it's great that that's happening in australia i just wanted to pick up quickly i've no i know i noticed there's a number of questions coming in around how can we make renewable energy uh more accessible in countries that um you know are not as well off as australia um countries like nigeria and the philippines and i just want to share some of my experience from cambodia um and that is that often the solar power is more affordable over time the issue is a cash flow issue um so being able to afford it up front um and then if you're paying it back over time as you're using the electricity actually it's more affordable often than the other fuel sources that those communities might have been using in the past such as kerosene or uh, for lighting for example or diesel for pumping water um so if there can be government programs or aid programs to help address the upfront costs and then communities can pay it back over time then that's a model that we have seen working in in many countries Thank you Chara thank you for sharing your thoughts on that I'll come to Sadaf uh can you share your thoughts on leveraging artificial intelligence uh to optimize waste management system whether it is food clothes or anything else I want to specifically talk about clothing because I worked in that industry uh for a bit um so there are different blockchain or AI based systems which are there 
in the industry where you could track not only your supply chain, but the, where the garment is coming from. So fiber trace can be one example. Another example is Transparency One. And we were engaged with Transparency One, which is, which is a North American company. And we can trace um, the whole supply chain where the garment is. So where the cotton is um, weaved, where it is converted into yarn, where is where the cotton was converted into uh, fibers and then garment and then a fabric and then garments. So the whole supply chain could be tracked through um, these blockchain uh, AI based systems and they are available in the market. And many brands are already using these blockchain softwares to track their supply chain. But the issue is that the supply chain ends where the supply chain ends where the brand where the brand gets the clothes and then it doesn't continue uh, when the customer buys it and that's that's the issue and brands are trying to solve this issue these days by introducing reverse logistics selling the product as services and how to in order to move towards a circular economy as well so um so yeah there there are systems there um and i've given some examples but uh, it's about tracing the supply chain from manufacturer to the brand. But then when brand hands over the product to the customer, where it goes, how it, the traceability becomes difficult. And, and people are trying to solve this problem, but they don't have concrete answers yet. Thank you for that answer. I'll come to Callum. One of the approaches for your organization is advocacy. Will you be able to share any event where Rewinding Australia had a positive impact to influence the government? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for the question, Karen. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the the work that um, the organisation did initially, the first result, our first report was uh, before I was involved, uh, was called Castles and Cars. You can find it on our website. Uh, we're about to release an updated. Um, updated version of that really looking at, at, at the, the stuff i've talked i talked about earlier but in a lot more detail around the costs and the commission savings and the benefits um and off the back of that and some really fantastic work from from my colleagues uh, lobbying in canberra um they uh the, the last the budget um last year would uh brought about huge investment, billions of dollars in electrification, $2 billion in, in electrification for you know households and, and communities across Australia. So yeah, the, the, the message is getting through. It's taking work. It's taking work from not only the colleagues at Rewiring and other organizations working on this, but also most importantly, actually the communities who have grabbed hold of this and are, are kind of running with it talking to, to their neighbors, taking it to their local councils. Uh, you know, it really needs to happen at every level. Um, you know, everything from you know, town councils and uh, and local councils have, have power in, in over, you know, new development and, and how we kind of encourage new developments to go electric. Um, state governments uh, here in Australia have a huge amount of power um, in terms of, uh, again, planning particularly, um, but also energy policy in lots of cases and and how they can really encourage and facilitate adoption. Um, and obviously the federal government also has has a huge amount of capital and investment power to to provide, as Jai was saying, I think, you know, I think access to that capital upfront and cost um, is is a problem in a, a, really across the world. More acute in, in certainly in the global south, I think, where, where capital can be much more of a problem, but it's a problem, you know, it, for electrifying really everywhere. And actually that kind of often that needs to come from from government support in a lot of cases because they can borrow for a lot less than the rest of us and, and they can use that borrowing power to to help everyone else um yeah i think that's thank you for sharing your views uh, i'll i'll try and squeeze in uh one question from uh from our audience one of our audience uh neil he has asked uh is it possible for community-led renewable energy projects to be adopted within a metropolitan context in a suburb or in regional areas absolutely it's just that what it looks like will be different so um in urban environments we've supported communities to run um, bulk buy and install of solar heat pumps electric vehicles all sorts of technologies that they can install in their own apartments or homes. 
Um, and with that, doing that as a community-based project means that you're doing it collectively. You're helping remove some of those barriers around market research and knowing, you know, which suppliers to trust, which technologies to trust. Um, but you're also able to build in elements around education and um, helping people understand how to use the systems to get the maximum benefit um, and, you know, how to be energy efficient in their homes. So there's those types of programs. But there's also, um, for example, the Sydney Entertainment Centre has a 300 kilowatt solar system on its roof because it's a community-owned uh, renewable energy pro uh, program. So there are significant roof spaces in cities that, and, and the, the, I can think of numerous examples where where community um, communities have funded um, and owned reasonably large rooftop arrays on the roof of bakeries, breweries, all sorts of um, buildings in the city. So there's those programs. And then there's programs where they form in solidarity with a project that might be in a regional area, but they become members, investors in a larger scale wind or solar farm somewhere else, but they're still, you know, able to participate. That really sums up most of it, I think. Just two other examples I can think of is um, community batteries, I think is something that we're really, really keen for. It's a regulatory nightmare in Australia and in a lot of parts of the world, uh, just because of the, um, just the way the institutions are arranged in our electricity system, um, you know, I won't go into it, but I think communities taking hold, taking ownership of batteries promises both, you know, democratic control, but also, you know, that money staying in the community for that's ultimately made from that battery. Um, and I think another, uh, I think Gerald's point about thinking differently about it, I think it's really crucial um, in a metropolitan area. There's, I think in Manchester in the UK, there's a great example of a community co-op that's running retrofit advice and services. You know, they are helping to, insulate you know basically help householders to insulate to electrify as well to put in heat pumps and and solar um you know i think big solar insulation although they're fantastic and work well on schools as jara mentioned and other places but yeah it can also be just a, a cool community business delivering another piece of the puzzle right thank you i have one question for sadaf is it possible for you to talk about uh, digital passports ensuring monitoring and transparency that you talked about uh, during the presentation yeah, I think digital passports work in very similar way as the barcodes work, barcodes work. So we put barcodes on different commodities and then they could be traced back to where they originated. But the digital passports, um, as they are developing now, they are also going to track the product once they leave the retail store or the brand to the customers. So it is not that it's not the, the concept is not that developed but then it is developing it's, it's still developing because many brands are trying to move towards the digital passport where they could track uh, where the product is coming from where it originated and where it's going till the end of uh, life thank you well uh, we are running short of time and this restricts me to ask any further questions but I'll request our speakers to answer the remaining questions offline. And for our viewers, do sign up our newsletter and get access to these Q&As and latest updates. And just to remind you that we have another webinar coming up next month on 17th, December 2024. It's, uh, the theme is SDG 16 and 17, which is Peace, Justice, and Strong Institution in Partnership for Goals and Sustainable Policies. So see you there.